Hello and welcome to World War II TV and today we are doing another one of our Conflict on the Camera shows and we are taking a picture of an Allied sniper in 1945 in Northwest Europe and to join me to talk about it is David O'Keefe, a World War II TV regular but a first time on a photo show. So, hello David. Hello, how are you? I'm good, thanks. This photo, David, it has been published many times. It's the front of various books. It's oft distributed on the internet, YouTube. The absolute first thing I notice about that photo is you would never, if you are a proper sniper, have your barrel of your number 40 actually out the window. You'd be back inside yeah. the room in the shadows with the window open and firing out that way. So clearly it's staged, but I will let you take on from there and explain where and when it was taken. And we can talk a little bit about the use of snipers in the ETO and particularly with regards to the Canadians and the book you wrote about the Black Watch snipers. So yeah. it's clearly staged. Tell us the story, David. Well, this is, uh, this is a photo that was taken February 14th, roughly, 1945, Battle of Gennep uh, during the Rhineland campaign, which is now, you know, we're coming up on the anniversary. As a matter of fact, the 70, 76th anniversary of this will be this week. And um, this was obviously a stage photo, as you say, and it's a member of the Imperial Black Watch, 5th Battalion, 51st Highland Division. And you're right, this is uh, a photo that's been seen many, many times. But as you correctly point out, no sniper in his right mind would ever be in a position like this. No, and I think we ought to also clarify the use of the word sniper, because often when you're reading an account from the war and it refers to a sniper, it's more likely referring to a single rifleman. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, they, you know, the Germans did work as lone wolves. The Germans tended to go out by themselves. But with the Allies, whether it be the British or the Canadians, they worked in teams. Mostly it was teams of two. You had a spotter and then you had the guy who would actually do the shooting. Sometimes you actually had teams of three, but it was more usual to go out in teams of two. So without a doubt, this, um, you know, this was staged specifically to, to capture that, you know, that stereotypical view that they had towards the end of the war of that lone wolf idea of a sniper. But that what really wasn't the reality of what sniping was all about within the Canadian and British forces. Yeah, exactly. And by sniper, I refer in my interpretation to someone who has specifically been trained in the role of shooting his rifle accurately, but also that whole maneuver, camouflage, concealment thing that goes hand in hand. You can give a guy the best rifle with the best telescopic sight, but unless he knows how to use it and how to conceal himself, he's not a sniper. So it frustrates me when we're talking about snipers and single riflemen. It's, it's like yeah. 88, it's like Tiger Tank, it's like anything else. He came under fire from a sniper. Sometimes it is a sniper. Sometimes it's just just a single it, rifleman. But in this case, we are fire. talking about snipers. Yeah. You've written about them. So how did the Canadian Army use snipers? And did it kind of change during the 44-45 period? Well, yeah. I mean, first of all, you have to go back. I mean, a lot of stuff that we see in the movies now, whether it be the current day, you have to remember there's a big difference now between the art of sniping or the craft of sniping and what it was during World War II. World War II, essentially, for the Allies, particularly the Canadians and the British, they, they drew their snipers from the men in the scout platoon, the newly formed scout platoon in 1944. There had always been scouts and snipers, you know, obviously back from World War I and World War II. But in February of 44, based on the experience and the impact that the Germans had in Sicily and Italy, the Allies decided that having a dedicated scout slash sniper platoon was the key, the way of, of moving forward in infantry battalions. So in this particular case, you have to remember that what you said is absolutely right, that it's not just a question of being a crack shot. That was something that definitely would get you in the door. But what made you effective in the field and better yet able to survive and fight another day was your ability to understand field craft, the ability of moving around, camouflage, understanding terrain, making sure that you were patient and you maintained fire discipline until you had a proper target. Now, that is in the traditional view of sniping. But what a lot of people didn't realize is that there was actually a different role that the snipers played within the infantry battalions. And without a doubt, in static situations, kind of like, you know, well, kind of what you see here in the, in the photo, you would engage in what we see as the traditional style. But a lot of people don't realize that in set piece assaults, 
The scouts and snipers were used for a different role, which was extremely dangerous. I would argue even more dangerous than this. And, um, you know, for those of you who understand the tactics from the Second World War, generally speaking, in a set piece infantry operation, you have a battalion of four companies, usually moving in box formation, two companies up, two companies back. You'll have artillery, a curtain of artillery fire and stonks coming down in front to pin the opponent as you close and kill. And then, you know, you'll have tanks, uh, you know, on the flanks to provide direct firepower. Sometimes you'll augment with machine guns. The idea is for the men in the front ranks to lean in, as they say, into the artillery barrage. Because the idea is as that barrage is coming down over the Germans, it's gonna pin them down. And then you wanna be on them as soon as that barrage lifts. If you don't, they're gonna have a chance to get up, get back to their weapons positions, open fire, and you're gonna be in trouble. So the idea with the sniper now in the set piece assault was although the front ranks of the infantry companies were about a hundred yards from their own artillery, they would actually put the snipers up 50 yards. So 50 yards ahead, and they would essentially act as human trip wires. And the idea was for them to advance really tight on their own barrage. And so when the barrage then rolled over or landed on the Germans and then lifted, as the Germans were scurrying out of their holes to come back to their weapons positions, whether it be machine guns, anti-tank or whatever else, they could pick them off. So the idea was to make sure that when you're closing time and space, it's not just the artillery that's coming down to do the damage, but also you have your snipers in place. But there was also something that was even more dangerous for them because if they could not take out their targets with the scoped rifles, they actually had a, what they call a very pistol or very light, which is a flare gun. And the idea was very much like in today's world where you would paint a target with a laser and then boom, the munitions would come in. The idea was to use the very light and fire different colored flares at whatever the target was for the assaulting tanks or the supporting tanks then to take on. So basically you're painting or marking a target, but of course you're using a flare gun. And if anybody's ever seen a flare gun, you know that it leaves a trail right back to where it was fired. So this is essentially to improve the accuracy of artillery. Artillery is an incredibly important power tool that we allies have in World War II, particularly 44, 45. But this is an ability to refine the accuracy of it by someone up front, a bit like a forward observer, but an armed forward observer who could also, as you say, take out targets himself and look for NCOs and officers and people in command. Yeah, I mean, that was the vulnerable part, right? The vulnerable part is as soon as that artillery stonk lifts, the Germans are going to come back out of their shelters and run into their positions and open fire. And if your infantry has not advanced quick enough, and likely 90% of the time, that's the case, you need something there to be able to delay and disrupt the enemy as they open fire or before they open fire. And you're right, you know, going after weapons, uh, you know, uh, anti-tank teams, machine gun teams, command and control, anybody barking out an order. Um, you know, a lot of times the snipers work just off of physical visual recognition. In other words, body language. They could see who was in charge just simply by the body language and then they would try to focus on that. And yet within this way of operating within the structure of the British and Canadian Army, there is also this sort of license in the sense of equipment. The use of body armor, I'm thinking of the fact the British 3rd Division used SS reversible smocks for their snipers, which is kind of asking for trouble, I think, when you're coming back. And you wanted to bring up body armor because... We think of armor, again, as a very modern thing and your Kevlar and your, you know, your Black Hawk Down kind of scenario. But it was experimented with in World War II to varying degrees of success and unsuccess. But there was a standard set of British Army and Canadian Army body armor. I used to own a set of it many, many years ago. Manganese steel plates, one of your kidneys and vital organs, one of your chest, and uh, it, it's sort of held together with webbing. And so you've got these photos that you acquired and you use in your book about the the body armor used by these yeah. guys. So explain a bit about how that came about and what you found out and how they used it. Well, you know, writing about uh, the Black Watch snipers at Varia Ridge, and of course, you know, the Canadian Black Watch end up, you know, taking a pace thing. They lose 94% casualties going up Varia Ridge. But just in the hours before they actually made the assault, they were issued with what was considered to be experimental body armor. And then you throw it, actually, it's supposed to be under your battle dress, and then you put the battle dress over. But because of the hurried conditions, uh, the Black Watch just simply threw it over their battle dress. So anyway, when the Black Watch goes into the attack on the 25th and they go up Verrier, 
they've all been outfitted with this. And that is something that um, I had heard about and read about in the accounts, but I had never seen any photographic evidence until actually I was researching the book and there was a, uh, a book written by Didier Lodio. He did a book on the 272nd German Infantry Division. So I was looking at it, and when I was going through it, I literally almost keeled over because here were some photos taken by a member of the 272nd of prisoners from the Canadian Black Watch that were taken during the assault or after the assault on Verrier Ridge. And they're standing there, and it was remarkable. And then there's one where you can clearly see the body armor, which has been hung over. And that is, I would argue, one of the most unique photographs that you're ever going to see. Because this is, you know, there was rumors of, you know, using this. There's reports of using it. But this, from what I can see, is the only real photographic evidence that we have of it actually in operation. So that confirms uh, the reports and the story. But let's get back to the photo and talk about some of the yeah. details in the photo. I mean, it's clearly a number 14, standardly Enfield yeah. sniper rifle as used by the Commonwealth armies. His battle dress appears to be normal. The helmet appears to be normal. Now, what does look interesting to me is the rolled up anti-gas cape on the back because it looks like it's been unrolled and rolled up several times. Normally, the anti-gas cape is something you just wear and you keep it rolled up and you don't use it very often because, of course, we never actually experienced gas in the in the Western Front. No. I mean, they use it as a waterproof. Do you think, because it looks like it's been used more often and he's using it for camouflage? That's my theory when I look at that. He's using that as some kind of ghillie suit device. Yeah, a lot of things. I mean, a lot of things you have to remember, it, it was idiosyncratic. There were things that were, without a doubt, issued. And then, of course, they jerry-rigged a lot of stuff. You always had your combat scarf, which doubled. It was a mesh scarf, which was really ingenious uh, because the mesh was just thin enough that you could put it over your face and you could break your line so nobody would pick you up, but you could still see through it, which was yeah. remarkable. And so it had, obviously, it's practical applications in the field when you're sniping or in a hide, but it also, and, and take this for a minute, somebody who served a bit of time in the army, it also came in handy when you went to the latrine because of course you could wrap your nose and your mouth around it. And it was great when you're sitting in the back of a, you know, a truck that's spewing diesel. So things were little as scarves and you could wrap it right around and it would filter out any of the diesel. So, you know, I mean, a lot of times with infantrymen, they're sucking diesel and dust. And yeah. so you need things like this. So not only is it practical for obvious reasons in the field, but then of course they started fashioning it into like almost like a balaclava where they would put it on the top of their head and it became very much distinctive of that scout sniper culture. And I, I've done a bit of reenactment, not real service, but pretend service. And that two foot square of scream is very, very useful because it's got the holes in it. So when you brown yeah. it, have your neck as a scarf, it keeps you warm, it's the pockets yeah. of air. You can use it as a bag to carry shit in. You can put it under your ass when you're arriving in a truck to, to cut out the bumps. It's just an incredibly useful bit of gear. You can use it as a tourniquet. Yeah, it's, it's the it's, Jeep for the infantryman. In other yeah. words, it has so many different uses and platforms, without a doubt. It's absolutely amazing. The other thing that's unique, of course, uh, is the battle smock. The smock essentially was a British paratrooper smock that was then specifically rigged for snipers. In other words, extra pockets for, you know, either maps or extra ammunition or things like that. And, you know, of course, the one thing that, you know, kind of slips through is the use of Benzedrine. Um, you know, they used to take either Benzedrine tablets or better yet, a lot of snipers used to keep Benzedrine inhalers, believe it or not. And because the idea was, you know, you'd be off in a hide somewhere, you'd be out for hours, you'd be on patrol, you needed to stay awake and you needed something even artificial to keep you going if necessary. But, you know, you think about the snipers, I mean, they're unlike the, the rifle platoon or the rifle companies where there's periods of sheer terror and then boredom. When you have a sniper and a scout, it's continual. The stress yeah. is continual because when you're not fighting, it, you know, in a set piece battle, you're doing your patrols. You know, you're out on reconnaissance patrols, listening patrols, sometimes fighting patrols, liaison patrols. It's constant motion. And even though I don't talk about it in the book, the Black Watch of Canada, their sniper platoon went through about nine or ten platoon commanders just in 10 months mm. just because of the demands before we move on any other details in that photo or any other remarks we want to make about particularly the snipers in the canadian i know we've addressed this is a british soldier here but was there anything else particularly that the canadian snipers adopted that was unique or particular to their nation 
Not really. I mean, most of the stuff that the Canadians were using was the standard, you know, pattern British, uh, British outfitting, uh, you know, whether it be from, you know, helmets to the ballot, no, no, to the scarf that we were talking about, the smocks. There was nothing that for I could see that was particularly Canadian unless something was developed towards the end of the war. Even the rifles. I mean, the rifles were, you know, manufactured in England and they, they were sent to an armor in England to be specially married up with the scopes. And that was one thing that the snipers always talked about was the fact that they would have a separate bag for their scope. And generally speaking, they tried not to take the scope off of the rifle because it was set perfectly. They'd have to, you know, recalibrate it and things like that. But most of their traditions were the same. I mean, you know, snipers are snipers. I mean, you, yeah. you fall in love with your weapon for obvious reasons. It's a marriage of convenience and sometimes it's passionate and sometimes it's just yeah, utilitarian, yeah. but they took care of them. You know, I mean, uh, one of my, uh, one of the snipers I write about, Jim Wilkinson, you know, used to clean the barrel twice. And uh, because he said cleaning it once wasn't good enough because basically the, the spit that they would use would then tend to, you know, swell up a little bit. So you had to get down twice. That was him. Others, you know, didn't go to that level. They had all their, you know, their little idiosyncrasies that they would, mm. bring, you know. I'm guessing they, they may have chosen a pair of boots without the hobnails on for, for silent purposes, either the crepe sole or the driver's boots or just without studying or later in all, because the Canadians did get ha hands on some of the corker and American jump boots. Maybe something like that would be a bit better for moving about quietly. I don't know, but... Yeah, sometimes they just did burlap, right? The burlap around, yeah. strapped it around. It depended on what they were doing. But, you know, to get back to what you were talking about, about all senses engaged, that's exactly what they had to do because, you know, on your average patrol... You would have to go out, you would have to almost see in the dark. You'd be listening like crazy, but more importantly, you'd be smelling. Because sometimes you can smell a change in just atmosphere. Sometimes you could smell tobacco. Sometimes you could smell the type of food that was being cooked. Um, you know, it depended where you were. I mean, a lot of times it was about getting as close to the enemy as humanly possible to overhear their conversations. Yeah. So there was generally always somebody in a scout platoon, scout and sniper platoon, who at least had a working understanding of German. And yeah. even if they didn't necessarily understand all the words, if they could pick up the kind of dialect, you may be able to figure out where the unit was from. You know, this was more prevalent in World War I, where you had, you know, Prussian units and Hessian units and things like this. But certainly, you know, you could pick up the difference and knowing whether, you know, the person in front of you was actual German or maybe he was Pole or maybe he was Czech. And that might give you a, an indication of the kind of quality and motivation of the forces ahead of you. And the other thing that they used to do, and this is obviously before they were taking cameras with them up in the front. I mean, now you'd probably use your iPhone, um, but they would sketch. They would have sketch pads yeah. and they would actually go out. And that's a lot of a lot of things that, you know, we, we tend to forget about the scouts and the snipers, you know, that they were doing much more than just shooting. And many times, you know, their sketches were absolutely crucial for planning, you know, small raids or fighting patrols or things along those lines, you know, getting into areas that aerial reconnaissance, you know, couldn't furnish, you know. Yeah, I was just going to make that point. The, the, the commanders are using aerial photos and maps, which yeah. are two-dimensional and from above, and there's nothing like that grounds eye view of something and, and exactly. where there might be walls down or something like that. If you're yeah. approaching somewhere, which bits of the enemy-held village have been knocked out, you can't see it in aerial photo. You can see it by looking at it. And they had Denison smocks that they used. They yeah. had loops and things on them for extra foliage, but they also yeah. had a pocket that they used for their notepad, for their sketch pad. And That's they had right. their China graph pencils because it had to be waterproof because they're out in the rain in their loops there for drawing that detail. Well, I mean, the interesting part is, you know, we were talking about the jerry rigging of the smock, the standard paratrooper smock. My understanding is an extra pocket was added specifically for the sketch pad. And then yeah. basically they used it for everything else. You threw in your candy bars, your inhaler and your sketch pad and your grease pencils and whatever else. So yes, I mean, this was something that they were thinking about when they were designing that smock for paratroopers. So that was a fascinating look at snipers, marksmen, scouts uh, within the uh, British and Canadian armies in the ETO. So thank you very much, David, for joining me. We'll surely have you on again soon because we've got a third part of our Dieppe show to do at some point. We'll do another photo. We can do something else. If you're happy to come back, we'll do something else. So I'd love to.